Good evening and welcome to another episode of the Transformational Coaching Podcast. I'm your host, Coach Hyman. Coming to you live, it is Season 2, Episode 3 of the Transformational Coaching Podcast. Tonight, uh, we are going to build off of uh, Episode 1 of the Build Better series where we talked about building better hitters through <clears throat> kind of the mindset that uh, hitters should be going through and then just the way we coach them up and prepare them uh, in BP. Um, So if you didn't catch that episode last week, make sure you go back and listen to it. Just being real, um, from a coaching standpoint, that was probably one of my, I feel like one of my better episodes just in terms of, you know, if if you're looking for a way to help your hitters take that next step, um, I know for our guys, uh, it's helped tremendously over the years. So have a listen. Uh, it breaks kind of my philosophy just hitting wise down. And then it really talks about, you know, for about 15, 20 minutes, just talks about a good BP routine, the one that we use every day that puts our guys in better situations uh, during BP so they're prepared to execute during the game. So uh, that was last week. This week we're going to talk about building better culture. Um, And that's going to be the topic of the episode today. So um, I realized on last week's episode that uh, you maybe the whole like intro of looking at a tweet and then breaking it down and giving my opinion on it's probably not the best use of time because then I end up talking about it for like 35 minutes. And then people who are here to actually watch the video or listen to the podcast to hear about becoming a better hitter, they're like, Dude, we're 25 minutes in and we haven't heard anything about hitting yet. So I'm trying to do a better job of staying on topic or at least um, talk about the actual episode up front and then go into other stuff later. So um, it's funny just kind of speaking about culture and building better culture. It's it's good timing for this because I was kind of putting some notes together trying to decide like kind of what direction I wanted to go with this and it's weird because when you start trying to rehearse stuff like this and like put notes down and and I mainly put notes down not to make sure to make it sound great but just to keep me on topic because if you've listened to my podcast you know I have a tendency to get going down a rabbit hole and then I never finish my original point um so it was just good timing that I got a text message a few minutes ago for one of my old players. And um it kind of just hammered home hammered home the point of like why we do what we do and why great culture is so important. And I won't you know mention the kid's name, but he just sent me a text. It was a picture of uh of me having, you know, when I was at South and I do this now at Trinity, um, after we take pregame infield give him a little quick pep talk. And uh, it was a picture that my good buddy David Yeasel took uh, of me having my, my usual pregame talk with them. And then in the picture, you know, you got the kid and I don't, I I don't remember exactly what happened that day, but I remember just making fun of something, just kind of keeping it loose. And I was like, all right, guys, give everybody a round of applause. And I, I don't remember what it was, but you can clearly tell in the picture that like they're clapping and giving somebody a round of applause. And I don't remember what it was, but um, you know, the text from this guy just said, miss you coach. And, uh, yeah, that's a kid that I had, he'll be a senior this year, but he's a guy I had that I knew when he was 12 years old, watching him play baseball. And, um, I always thought when I was watching him play, when I was the opposing coach, like what a pleasure it would be to coach a kid like that. And I've been fortunate over my coaching career to have a lot of kids like that, that, you know, I look at them as an outsider and say, man, I bet it'd be a pleasure to coach that kid. Um, And then through coaching high school baseball and because of where I coached, I actually got to coach a lot of those kids for, you know, six years. Um, It's truly a blessing. Like, you know, you think about what great culture means and like why we do what we do. It's the text messages like that from a guy who just on a random night is like, hey, man, coach, I was thinking about you. Just want to let you know I miss you, you know. And um, that's why we do it. Like sometimes I need I'm, I'm a new head coach now. And, um, you know, sometimes you need 
like just a reminder that maybe you are doing things right. Cause I mean, to all these kids I'm coaching now and I love them to death. Um, I got good parents and good kids in my, in my program at Trinity, great coaches helping us. Um, but you wonder sometimes like, do they really believe what, I mean, do they believe in what we're doing here and you know, is what we're doing right. And, um, when you get texts like that, when you get reminders like that, the timing couldn't be better. Um, because it just tells you like, we are in fact doing things the right way, because if we weren't, I wouldn't get texts like that. So I don't know if the guy who sent me that is still listening, but I needed that and I appreciate it. And, uh, yeah, love all those guys. Uh, everybody I've ever coached, man, it's just a different kind of love. So anyways, didn't mean to get off on that. It just, it kind of segued into, why great culture and why the investment in great culture is so important. So um, it's kind of the intro. Part one of this basically got it broken into three parts. So part one, we'll talk about what is great coach culture and why is it important. We kind of talked about the why a second ago. Part two is the actual act of building a great culture and what that looks like. I'll give a few examples of some of the stuff that we do, some of the things that we believe uh, as we talk through that. And then part three of this will just be uh, sustaining great culture. And it's not overly long, but just some uh, some things that I think are some obvious things that, you know, we just want to focus on as we start building great culture and what we have to do to really sustain that because, you know, complacency is, is not good and we don't want to get complacent. So uh, what is great culture? You know, great culture is more than just, you know, wins and losses. We talk about, you know, you talk about every great coach who, you know, you look at talk about a Nick Saban, uh, people like that. I mean, <laughs> at the end of the day, Nick Saban's not going to win a national championship every year, right? Um, he's just not because that's not, that's not the measure of what a great culture is. Like, yeah, at the end of the day, like, Normally, teams with great culture are probably going to hang more banners than teams with bad culture, but um, great culture is really independent of wins and losses and championship banners and all that. A lot of times they come as a result of great culture, but um, it's not the driving force behind it. You know, great culture is what we are, um, why we show up and do what we do every day. Um, you know, great culture extends far beyond beyond the playing field uh when you're a part of something where great cultures you know where you're a part of great culture a lot of times that trickles into areas of your life outside of you know what you do in between the lines and when the lights come on you know it's an integral part like for me being a part of great you know teams with great culture either as a player uh, as a coach as an employee it's pushed me to to heights that I never thought that I would be able to get to uh, as a man, as a father, uh, as a husband, as a coach. Um, great culture motivates you to get up and push forward and do what you want to, you know, be a part of what you're trying to be a part of every day. You know, you know, you know and you can think about just, you know, as an employee, um, when you're part of a team where great culture is at the forefront of everything you do, it's easy to get up on Monday morning and go to work. Uh, one of my coaches, Coach Bowie Olson, a uh, guy I have a tremendous amount of respect for. Um, you know, he he runs a company, very successful company, company that's been around forever. And his do his guys, his employees, they love showing up and going to work on Mondays because they have great culture, uh, and that's what it's all about. And as a result of that, he gets a lot out of those people because um, they love what they do and they love who they work for. And when you love what you do and love who you work for, or love who your leader is, you're going to try to excel for that person. And then as a, as a result of all that, you know, all that positivity, all that great stuff you got going on at work, it trickles on, it trickles over at home and with your kids and your wife, it just, it's a trickle down effect. Um, and again, it's all independent of whatever the outcome is of what we're trying to seek. So like, you know, if I want to be the number one sales rep in Novartis, that's totally independent of the great culture that my team has. Like being a part of a great team, uh, or sorry, being number one sales rep may come as a result 
of being a part of a great team. It's not, oh, well, you weren't number one, so you're not a part of great culture. Totally independent of each other. So just make sure you always remember that. And then as far as why is it, why is it important, um, kind of given some examples of that already, so we won't expand too much on it. But um, what I just talked about earlier, you know, my why as a coach is getting – text like that my you know my why as a coach and why great culture is important is what i've watched our kids do for the first nine weeks of the summer uh, at trinity you know we started wow. implementing that great culture and they had good culture before but we just made a couple of tweaks to it and made it a little bit better i think but um what those dudes accomplished this summer knowing us for nine weeks, being committed to what we're doing, um, it's going to pay dividends for those guys moving forward. You know, so that's part of the why. You look at, you know, the guys that I coach at South, um, the great culture we built there over the years. Um, it was incredible what those guys continue to do year after year after year. So, you know, people can say culture doesn't matter, but you can look around, especially in this area, and you can see um, – teams with great talent that have piss poor culture that consistently uh, under underachieve. Whereas you see teams that maybe on paper aren't as talented as them, but have great culture, they consistently overachieve. And then when they finally get a team that like on top of the great culture, they also are very talented. Sky's the limit, you know, AKA 2023 South Florence Bruins. Look what those guys did. So um, that's great culture. That's why it's important. We can move over to part two now, building great culture uh, and what that looks like. And again, I kind of broke this down into probably three or four points here. Um, it's not a step-by-step -step process. It was just kind of like an overview of like if, you know, as I walked into Trinity, for instance, uh, what we had to do, what my process was for how are we going to build great culture. Um, so I think step one, anytime you're diving into this whole building great culture thing, uh, is looking in the mirror, man. Um, you got to have the ability to reflect you have to have the ability to be honest of, of what you're stepping into and what you have. Um, we got to understand where we're at so we can map out where we're going. And this is for everybody. This is uh, as coaches, as players, administration, um, parents, everybody. Uh, when you're new to something, um, or even when you're not new, I mean, I've been coaching for a long time. And I think the thing for me is like, because we understood early on how important culture was, we were always trying to, you know, take the 120 foot view and look, you know, take ourselves out of the situation and look and say, Hey, if I was the out an outside person looking into this, you know, what would I say our strengths are? What would I say our, our weaknesses are? What's working? What's not? Um, you know, that's all vitally important. You know, I, I just think, um, and, and, and this is not just like, you know, I think for me as a coach, I'm constantly like having to evaluate myself and say, okay, you know, what am I doing well? What am I not doing well? Um, not just like X's and O's wise, but maybe the way I do things that are, you know, Am I asking people to show up early, but then I'm not showing up early as a coach? Um, am I asking my kids to be in shape, but then I'm looking like a slob? You know, those are like, that seems minimal, but to somebody who's really committed to building great culture, you have to evaluate all that stuff. Um, I think another thing that's important is establishing what great culture is not. So as we're taking this look at where we're at and where we're trying to go, I think it's important for everybody involved to understand, you know, how we're going to measure great culture. What is it? What is it not? You know, 
for us, I think, and I take a lot of pride in this, you know, especially now, like being the leader of a program, um, you know, great culture is not a dictatorship, right? I, um, take a lot of just pride in the, the, the guys that I coach with. Um, you know, I, coach Kirk Corbett told me a long time ago when I first got into coaching, he, uh, he was real big about, you know, the PD snipers, which was our team at the time. It wasn't his team. It was our team. And that's just something that's always carried with me. And like when I was at South, we always worked really hard to make sure, you know, coach Gray did a great job of that, of making sure we all felt like this is our team, not his team. Now, at the end of the day, he's got to answer all the questions. Um, but he gave us a lot of ownership in helping us get to the outcome that we were looking for. Um, you know, when I was there, my job was outfield and base running. And he let me coach those two things exclusively. He didn't interfere if he had questions, if he had concerns, if there were things that maybe he wanted to implement. We talked about it. But he let me take complete ownership over that. It wasn't a dictatorship. I think that's important. So as I go to Trinity uh, with our coaches, it's very similar to that. You know, Coach Brian Brown has full autonomy to coach our pitchers the way he needs to coach them uh, on game days. I'm not making a lineup with a pitcher in it. I'm going to talk to Coach Brown about who we're throwing, who's in relief. And then as a coaching staff, we'll build lineups around him. I'm not looking to him saying, hey, let's take, we need to take him out at X amount of pitches or he's had enough. You know, he has full autonomy, 100% ownership to own that. And I want him to own that. Coach Bowie Olson, his job is to work with our catchers. And, um, you know, he may, there's, there's been times over summer. I was like, man, I'm not necessarily comfortable with that decision. I'm thinking that, but like, just because you're not comfortable with it, you got to let your guys, that's their thing. And if they see something that you don't see, let's roll with it. See what's, and, and he's about five for five on decisions that worked out over the summer that I probably was slightly uncomfortable with when he suggested them. But you can't just say these things and not be about it. You have to, you got to be about it. And, you know, I say, Hey, this is not a dictatorship. This is a, um, partnership. This is our team. You know, catchers are your thing. That's your job. Um, you got to roll with it. Okay. Um, there's Trey Allison. Yeah. He's our infield guy. And we all work together with the hitters. And then I do the outfield and the base running. So we got a really good thing going. But the point is, like, what is great culture? If great culture is giving your coaches a lot of ownership. It's not dictating to everybody how we're going to do things, right? Um, great culture is not just results-oriented. I'm truly a believer that great results come from our, our – are a result. So championships, all that other stuff are a result of you building the right culture, right? Um, you having the right core values, you having the right non-negotiables. I think all those things come as a result of that. Okay. Um, it's possible. Well, I won't say all that, but it's not only results oriented. Very rarely will you see a team with great culture that's not constantly putting themselves in a position to be to to be standing at the end. Uh, and sometimes you're not going to have all the Jimmies and the Joes. Uh, and sometimes the other teams are going to be totally, you know, you might be overmatched or whatever. But when you have great culture, it closes the gap between you and your opposition. When you have great culture, it extends the gap between you and somebody who's not as good as you. If somebody's better than you, it closes the gap there. Um, great culture does not have a lot of people where there's no accountability, uh, no accountability and no discipline. Um, it's not normal to be a team that's great, to be a great program, to have great culture. That's not normal, okay? Uh, it takes a lot of work. And in the world we live in now, um, people don't work, in my opinion, the, the masses don't work as hard as they used to. 
Uh, they don't go through the struggles the way they used to. They don't ride the ups and downs like people used to. Like today's society is very soft in a lot of ways. Uh, they're not disciplined. Nobody's holding people accountable. Um, you know, so in that, that's kind of normal. Like we're just kind of in a mess as a country. And as you look across the, the world, just in general, you don't see a lot of great culture. They don't see a lot of great culture coming out of the White House. You know what I mean? Um, I don't see a lot of great culture in, in the NBA or other professional sports. Um, I don't see a lot of great culture at a lot of levels of like politics and, and even, you know, companies and just big companies and stuff like that. It's just, it's not the norm anymore. You, you don't walk around saying great culture there, great culture. There. There's not great culture on every street corner. Uh, and again, I think that comes back to there's not enough people holding people accountable and there's not a pe enough people who are disciplined, who are willing to go through the growing pains that it takes to be a part of a great culture. So that's kind of part one of that, you know, and that's just, brief recap of step one of building great culture is going to be got to take a look in the mirror, um, understand where we're at so we can map out where we're going. That's for everybody, coaches, players, parents, administration. Uh, we have to find out what's working, look at what's not working, um, and we need to make sure we establish what great culture is not, okay? Um, the next thing is established championship traits. Okay. So we've evaluated everything. We see what we have. We figured out what we're good at, what we're not good at. Uh, now we got to get everybody on the same page. We got to get everybody drinking from the same water hose. And the way we do that is we establish championship traits. So championship traits are broken down into core values, non-negotiables, and expectations of the program. And these are all things that at any point in time, you know, Coach Andy Hallett said this a while back at a, at a coach's clinic, and I've kind of put this at the forefront of a lot, a lot of what I coach now. He said, your players and your coaches and your parents, they've got to know everything, everything that's important to you, like somebody knows one plus one equals two. Um, I didn't really understand what that meant at first, but then I was like, okay. And he kind of broke it down. He said, yeah, well, what's one plus one? This is a room of coach. Everybody's like, two. You know. Um, Okay, what's 752 times 763? Well, I don't know. I need a calculator. That's right. Okay, the things that are vital to you as a coach and vital to you as a program, vital to you as a parent, a boss, whatever, um, you've got to know those things, and the people in your organization have to know those things like they know one plus one. Um, that's how we know. Like, we can't just know it. We got to know it, know it. Know it, know it like you know one plus one equals two. Okay. Um, so as we're establishing these traits, um, core values are going to be at the forefront of everything that we do. Okay. Your core values are who we want to be. They're who we want to be. Um, well, before I say all that, also we talk about knowing these things like one plus one, people can't know these things if you don't have the conversation with them to let them know that this is important. So my advice to anybody trying to build great culture is as soon as is as close to day one as possible, you need to have a sit down with parents, coaches, players, and you need to put this stuff on paper and you need to hand them a book that says, here's our program manual. Because that's the only way you can set that expectation so these people can begin to know this. Right. Uh, if you're not if you're not doing that, then. People aren't going to know. Right. Put it on paper. Get put it in their hand. Go through every single sheet of it. Go through every single page of it in a parent meeting. You got to let people know what's up. If you, because that's how you get people drinking from the same water hose. They hear it from your mouth. They see your face. They look your right. See the whites, the white in your eyeball, eyeballs. And they see you go over this stuff and they know, okay, this dude's not playing. Like these are things that are important. So anyways, core values. Who we want to be. That's, that's what our core values are. So for us at Trinity, um, you know, our core values are we over me. Uh, that's number one in everything we do. We're going to put the needs of the team over the needs of each other. Uh, we're going to put 
the needs of the program, over your individual, you know, feelings, sadness, whatever. The team wins a game, but you go 0 for 4, tough. Okay, won't be the last time you go 0 for 4. Uh, but the fact that the team got the job done trumps your, you know, feelings about your bad night. It's okay to be upset about it, but a kid should never be walking to the car after going 0 for 4, um, feeling like, oh God, well, I would. I would have, I would have separate, I would have substituted a loss for me to go one for four, you know, we over me, um, program over me, uh, that's core value. Number one, core value. Number two is going to be discipline. Number three is accountability. Uh, number four is blue collar. So those are, when I think about what I want our program to embody, uh, what I want other people to think about us. I want coaches, parents, ADs, whoever, to say, those dudes at Trinity, they're one unit. They got everybody drinking from the same water hose. They sacrificed their individual accolades, stats, feelings, whatever, for the for whatever's best for the team. They're a disciplined group. They clearly hold each other accountable, and those dudes are blue-collar. They're nasty, just nasty. They outwork everybody. Uh, that's what I want people to think of me. So when you think about your core values as a coach, those are the things you want to think about. Like, who do we want to be to ourselves? Who do we want? Uh, how do we want others to perceive us? Uh, that's what your core values are all about. Okay. Now, the next step, that's going to be your non-negotiables. And again, put it on paper, man. Put it on paper. Uh, and go through every single bullet point with everybody in your program. You got to do it. So your non-negotiables are going to tell us uh, what we're going to do and how we're going to do it, right? So still on the establishing championship traits, part two of that non-negotiables or your non-negotiables, what we're going to do, how we're going to do it. The good thing about this is like when you know how we're going to do things and what we're going to do, it starts really creating expectations, which ultimately generates accountability, right? Uh, when people know what your non-negotiables are, they know what we're going to do, how we're going to do it. They start understanding, well, if I don't do it this way, there's repercussions. Uh, and that's why we do it. And um, I'll give you an exa some examples of like our non-negotiables at Trinity. So I, I broke them down. I break them down every year for our guys into a you will category and give them bullet points on you as an individual, what you're going to do. Then you as a student, what you're going to do. And then we go as far as offensively, this is what we're going to do. Defensively, this is what we're going to do. Um, all of those things are important because, again, it establishes how we're going to do what we're going to do and what we're going to do. Um, and ultimately, that stuff is going to become what we do every single day of our lives at practice uh, and then we get it, when we get into the game. So uh, I won't read all this, but um, so our non-negotiables, you will be a positive representative of this program and your family. You will be a great teammate. You will be on time. You will be the best competitor on the field. We're going to win this pitch. Compete with confidence. You will be the best at your role. They all are equally important, but they're not always equal in size. You will be locked in wherever your feet are. You will learn to love the weight room. That's what we're going to do and how we're going to do it as individuals. When we jump into the classroom side of that, in the classroom, you will be a great student, be on time, be respectful, be a friend to man. Because, uh, again, this is bigger than just life. It's bigger than baseball, right? Um, they're student athletes. So there's going to be an expectation of, yeah, you're going to compete on the on the field. Yeah, you're going to be all these great things. But when you're a student, because that is part of your identity, you will be these things. Here's what you're going to do and how you're going to do it. Okay. Uh, I won't get too much into this, but then offensively, we will 
be the best base running team in the in the state. We will make our opponents play defense when we get two strikes. We will score runners from third base with less than two outs. We will control the controllables. We will know the value of an extra ninety feet. So, um, you get the point. And and go through this infielders. This is what your infielders will do. We're going to make the routine plays. We're going to be in the position to make the tough ones. Outfielders. Here's what you're going to do. Catchers. Here's what you're going to do. Pitchers. Uh, we will believe our best three pitches be the hitter's best three swings every time. We will control the running game. Okay, those are even, this will help drive what, what you're going to do in practice every day. So when your guys show up and they don't understand why you're spending 15 minutes doing PFPs or why you've got, um, you know, a base running group every single day in BP or, you know, why you're doing the same outfield drills every single day. Um, there won't be any questions about that because they know. Based on the meeting I had with coaches, the coaches, and based on, you know, what they told me their non-negotiables were, this is why we're doing what we're doing and how we're doing it, right? So hopefully that makes sense. Um, I think the other thing about non nego just really any of these things, is, well, I'll talk about that in a minute. Let me get through the uh, expectations of the program. So um, the third part of that building great culture is establishing expectations of the program, right? And these expectations ultimately tell us why we do what we do. Okay. So we've got your core values that tell you who we want to be. You've got your non-negotiables that tell us what we're going to do and how we're going to do it. Then you have your expectations of the program. And this is why we do what we do. Okay. So for us, we want to compete for a state title every year. We want to be the best program in the PD, public or private. We want to prepare our young players for life beyond baseball. We want to build great young men. We want to, we want academic excellence. We want to reload every year, not rebuild. And we want to be champions on and off the field. Okay. So you've got all that going on. Expectations finish it off. It tells us why we do what we do for those six bullet points. For us, those six bullet points, that's why we do what we do. Um, and that, you know, that's going to look different for everybody. You know, some people, uh, maybe a state title is not all that important every year. You know, I've had many coaches tell me, like, man, you can't really have a state title as the expectation of the program. It's okay to have expectations as stretch goals. OK, but truly, um, I'm just a firm believer that when you start using those words every day, um, you start talking to your guys about those things. You know, they start to understand why they do what they do. They understand why they start preparing for baseball season, you know, in August of every year for a season that doesn't start for six months after that. Um they understand the why behind all that because they understand what the expectations are. Um, it's just crucial. I, I, for me, it's crucial. I know some people like, I know Coach Gray was always like, ah, well, you know, we you can't make state title the, the end goal because, yeah, well, no, sorry. He was, I think there for a while we used to, you know, say, well, we want to we win a region championship and we want to win a state title and blah, blah, blah. The problem was the problem with making the region championship one of your expectations is you cannot win the region but still win state. So you look at the season as a failure because you didn't win region, but you win state. You, of course, you're going to look at the season as a as a success, not a failure. Um, so you got to be. He's his whole point was you got to be careful with what we put as expectations. But for me, state title is the expectation every single year. Um. Yeah, you know, in the years that we don't have the Jimmies and the Joes to do it, we still want to try to be the best program in the PD. And whether we're the best program in the PD or not, we're still going to prepare our guys for life beyond baseball because we want to have great young men, right? So, um, the next part of this, now that we've kind of talked about building great culture, what that looks like, you know, you can have great ideas, uh, you can have all this stuff, but you got to be able to execute on the vision. And that's going to be the next part. Um, 
and I think, you know, I don't have a lot of notes on this part, but it's just, you know, I think about how we've had the success we've had over the years. And uh, I remember it was a process, right? So I think for coaches, players, parents, whatever, I think step number one to execute on your vision is understanding that it's an absolute process and it's not going to happen overnight. And, you know, it's going to, there's going to be times where it's really tough. Um, I think, you know, true growth, the way that looks, uh, is sometimes you're going to take 10 steps back, you know, to make a giant leap forward. And it's going to tell our, our hitters now, especially this time of the year, because, you know, we're about to really dive into breaking some things down mechanically for some of these guys and really prepare them to take the next step as hitters. And because we haven't had really had an opportunity to change much with our new guys mechanically, but the thing we kind of warned them and cautioned them about is like, it's going to get ugly before it gets better. Uh, because right now the things that we're doing, the old bad habits we had, they're comfortable. So the minute we try to make a change and we don't get instant feedback, it becomes uncomfortable and we want to give up on it. Um, you know, you got to stick with the process and you got to be committed to doing things the right way, even when it's tough. Um, so as we talk about executing on the vision, truly that is because it's a process, it's step one is like it's a commitment every day to doing it the right way. Um, as coaches, you know, what we allow is what we promote, right? So if your non-negotiables are guys better be on time and people are showing up five minutes before practice starts, they're late. So what are you going to do about it? Right. Because if you allow it, you're really not big on your non-negotiables. And guess what? Now we're not executing on the vision. And, and people are going to like, I promise you now, when the Trinity Titans start August 14th or whatever the date is, um, there's going to be some tough conversations that are had between September, between August 14th and September 1st, because new guys, new program. Um, it, and this happened at South for us, like even, you know, every year, you know, people are going to constantly try to push the needle and try to figure out just, you know, how serious you are about the things that you say are important. And the minute you give them an inch and you allow them to be late or you allow them to show up to practice with their shirt tail untucked, or you allow them to wear a Hey Bo shirt instead of a Trinity shirt, or you allow them to hit in Crocs instead of making them wear turfs or cleats. Like the minute you do that and you don't correct it, you, what you're saying is my non -nego no, my non-negotiables really aren't all that non-negotiable, right? So as coaches, great culture is going to start with you. Executing on the vision starts with you, like at the very top of the totem pole. What you allow is what you promote. And then the second part of that is, are you holding yourself to the same standard that you're expecting your kids to hold themselves to, right? Uh, are you telling them to be early, but you're showing up five minutes before practice? If you are, don't be surprised if you guys don't execute on the vision the way you want to, right? Because what's in, you should never ask a kid to do something that you're not willing to do yourself. And, uh, you know. The best coaches out there, if they're asking their kids to be there 30 minutes early, they're there 45 minutes early, right? Just is, is what it is. Um, another thing on executing the vision, you know, I think one of the most crucial things, and, and I've, I've said this a lot on this podcast, is, you know, getting everybody drinking from the same water hose, right? Uh, and part of helping people drink from the same water hose is... Like, you got to build them up as people and men first um, because when they know you care and they know you love them, um, they're motivated to do well for you. They're motivated to do well for the program. Um, when there's a certain level like, man, this guy loves me, cares about me, you know, he wants me to be a great player, he wants me to be a great person, like... I'm lucky to be a part of this great program. Like it's going to push them to show up and like do what they need to do. Um, 
be on time, execute the vision, do the things on there and take care of the controllables. Uh, that's huge. The next thing, just kind of building on that because of the whole building them as men first and like keeping the relationship aspect at the forefront, like you guys got to know you care about them, man. Like, I, I think Coach Ray, I've talked about this before, Coach Rage Dickerson was really big on the whole love aspect of coaching. And I didn't really buy into that to begin with because I think when I got into coaching initially, I was all Frank, Mark, Frank Martin-esque about everything. And I thought you had to be the loudest guy in the building and you had to be all these things. And, you know, if people on the outside couldn't hear you, then you weren't coaching and, you know, blah, blah, blah. Um, what I found, though, is... Yeah, as mean and stern as Frank Martin seemed on the outside, that dude loved his players. And, but there was a fine balance like between a college athlete and a high school athlete. So like over time, I think it was Coach Rhodes was like, hey man, you know, you gotta kind of got to build them up a little bit. You got to love them a little bit more. You know, you got to, you got to do those things. And I, I think sh over time, um, kind of softened up a little bit in that aspect and it paid dividends for us just because I truly know now that once your guys know you love them um those tough conversations that have to come sometimes because of that because you know they disappoint or they don't do what they're supposed to do it softens that a little bit and it just hits differently um you're not just some random dude just yelling and cussing and carrying on because you're trying to get another w on your career stats, right? They know, hey, this dude loves me, cares about me. Uh, he's never steered me in the wrong direction. So the fact that he's having a stern conversation with me means I probably screwed up pretty bad. Um, and I think as coaches and, and players, we've got to embrace those tough conversations um, because we know they're coming from a good place uh, as parents. You've got to embrace tough conversations. You've got to be okay. Like we talk about executing on the vision. Like I've said this a million times, team chemistry and culture is killed on the ride home and, and at the dinner table, right? Because kid has a bad game, has a bad practice. Kid gets benched, whatever. They get in the car, they get home. Mom and dad immediately get upset um, or whatever. Don't like what coach said to the son, whatever. Now we're starting to kill the culture. Now we're no longer embracing uh, executing on the vision. Um, because in fact, now as parents, we're tearing that down. So my point to all that was like, as parents, be okay with your kids being coached, be okay with adults other than you holding them accountable, having tough conversations with them. I tell our kids this all the time. Do your parents love you? Yes, they do. Do they have tough conversations with you? Yes, they do. Does that mean they love you any less? No. Same thing with us as coaches. Um, tomorrow for our program, uh, we have our exit interviews starting tomorrow. So Monday, Wednesday, Thursday of this week, we'll have exit interviews with each one of our players who played with us this summer. There's going to be some tough conversations that happen over the next four days because we're going to talk about the things they did well. We're going to talk about the things they didn't do well. We're going to talk about the things that they have to do moving forward. We're going to talk about what their role currently is as we move into the fall and spring and what they're going to need to do to improve that role if they want to. So nine guys are going to be pretty happy when they say, hey, man, as we go into the fall, you know, if I had to make a lineup right now, you'd probably be my starting left fielder. Whoever that other left fielder is, he's going to be thinking, well, damn, that sucks. Um. But it's okay because just because you're not the starting left fielder or right fielder or second baseman or whatever, it doesn't mean you're any less valuable to the team. Um, your role's huge because, again, we're like a pie chart, man. Everybody's got a role. Some people's role is bigger than the other, but execution of each role is vital to the team's success, right? So, you know. Guys got to understand what their role is. And the only way for them to understand that is to have tough conversations. And for guys that have a starting role, like in their role is a little bit bigger, you have to have tough conversations with them too to let them know, hey, if I had to make a lineup up right now, you'd be that guy. But you got to keep raising the bar every day because if you don't, 
the guy whose role is a little bit bigger, a little bit smaller than yours, um, who maybe his role is going to be to play defense innings five through seven or, you know, courtesy run or whatever. If you get complacent and he gets real hungry, me and you are going to be having a different conversation, right? Um, you got to have those tough conversations. You have to set up the expectations. Um, but I truly believe, and I've never, I've never, never say never, but when you focus on building them as men and you focus on the relationship and you let them know you love them, I've never had a guy or a parent have an issue with any of those tough conversations because they know, they know, they're like, hey, Stu's never steered my kid down the wrong direction before. He's always been honest with them. And on top of being honest with them, he's always done everything he could to try to help them increase their role, be available when they need extra help, uh, always coach them up, not play favorites, you know, all those things. So um, that, that was kind of long-winded, but that was that. So embrace the tough conversations. That's part of executing on the vision. So um, I think the one important thing we talk about executing on the vision and executing on team great culture and all that is as you experience success, um, and you go through tough times, those core values, those should start showing, right? Um, if we're doing our job as coaches, uh, when we're 15 games deep and we get into the si- the sixth inning and we're down three, everybody in the stadium should know what we're all about. They should see that blue collar mentality. They should see the team over me. Um, They should see the great attitudes and the effort and the love for the program and love for each other and all that other stuff. They should see that if we're doing it right. If players and coaches are doing it right, uh, it will show in your play. People will say, man, those dudes don't go away, man. They just keep fighting. They don't quit. Yeah. We're that team. We're going to be that team. We're going to be that team that, A team's like, damn, if we're down by one, like, if we're down by one in the seventh, we cannot take our foot off the gas because they're that team that is going to do everything possible to win that baseball game. And they're going to lean on each other and they're going to execute. And if one guy doesn't, the next guy will. Like, that's what we're going to be all about. We're going to be like a bunch of gnats that don't go away. Um, But if you're doing it right, if all this stuff is 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 part of what you do every day in practice, if it's part of what you do every day outside of the field, um, if you're holding if you're holding everybody to a high standard, uh, it's going to show uh, as competition gets gets going and all that. So, um, the last point I meant to make this point earlier, but you know we talk about executing on the vision grit is a extremely important thing. Coach Timo, Coach Tony Moore, uh, he was one of our coaches at South. He's, I think he coaches middle linebackers or the linebacking group at South Lawrence football team. But, you know, he always talked about having some grit in your ass and, um, you know, being comfortable, being uncomfortable, you know, being willing to buy into the process and, and fight to the last out and, last breath and, you know, all that other stuff. I I meant to make that point that, like, without grit, your guys aren't going to be able to fall back, you know, have the courage to keep showing up and fighting every day when things aren't going their way. And in a sport like baseball, things aren't going to go your way a lot, right? So through how we execute our culture, uh, how we execute that vision, we should be teaching them how to have a bunch of grit. Uh, how to have the courage to show up and fight when I'm over my last 12. You know, how do I have the courage to show up at the ballpark with confidence when, you know, I haven't had a hit in four games or I've been tattooed my last two outings? You know, how do you have the courage to do that? You have the courage because of grit and because of you being committed to this process and this program and our non-negotiables and our core values. Those are who you've become. So that's how you have the courage to show up and have grit and fight today when everything hadn't been going your way. So, so that's that. Um, the last thing we want to talk about. So, so far we've talked about what is culture. Uh, we've talked about uh, building that great culture. 
which it's arguable whether building or sustaining is tougher. Um, I think sustaining is probably a little bit easier because you kind of, as a program, you, you start moving like a well-oiled machine. The reason sustaining isn't always easy from a wins and losses standpoint, though, is because of the fact that you are up and down talent-wise. And some years you're going to have the Jimmys and the Joes, and some years you're not. But um, the last part of this, sustaining great culture, what does that look like? So, um, and to the point I just made earlier, you know, the Jimmys and the Joes and, you know, your ability to, you know, your talent level will fluctuate. But the values of your program should never fluctuate uh, as far as like deep in your loins, what you're built on, what your program's based off of. Um, the things that work should not change. You know, I can tell you for me, like my, non-nego- my non-negotiables, I'm pretty solid on those. Those aren't changing. My core values as a program, those aren't changing because those are all the things that over the last seven years of my coaching career have been proven to make the to be the difference in teams that win versus teams that lose, teams that have great culture versus teams that don't. Okay. But to sustain great culture, we do have to be willing to not be complacent. Um and that doesn't mean, you know, like I, I wouldn't look at my core values and non negotiables and expectations and say, well, me not be being willing to change those means I'm being complacent. No, complacent complacent is there's always work that needs to be done, right? Um and that might be in our execution of those things, there's work that needs to be done, right? From a talent standpoint. Uh, for us to become better hitters or better defenders or better pitchers or better catchers or whatever, you know, there's always work that needs to be done there. You know, I think the thing we always have to evaluate as coaches is, um, is are the things that we're teaching still the best way to do things? That's something I always, always, always am asking myself. Are the way that we do bunt coverages Are they still the right way? Is the way that we teach hitting the right way? How about base running? Yeah, me and Coach Rojas, and this is kind of a dumb, like I think people on the outside would look at this and say, "Eh, that's kind of dumb. But, you know, we saw every year we'd have the same like debate about is it left pivot step step off of first base or is it right left shuffle shuffle as far as getting your lead? And I think what we, the conclusion we came to is it really doesn't matter. Right. They're both accomplishing the same job. But the fact that we are willing to have that same argument every year showed that we were never complacent on something as small as getting a lead from first base. Um, you know, and that's that kind of was very indicative of how we were as a coaching staff, um, because we were always looking for opportunities to grow as coaches, always looking for opportunities to help our players grow. Um and we were always challenging the status quo on how we did things. You know, we three years ago, we would have never, never used pitching machines for BP. Today, we don't throw BP, right? Um, outside of, like, working on, you know, specific drills, like front toss or offset BP, where you're working on something specific, we don't, we don't do that. And that's because we didn't get complacent. And just say, well, this is how we do BP, and this is how we make, you know, build great hitters. You know, and it's always worked, so we'll just keep on doing. It. No, you always got to be chasing and checking, chasing and checking, chasing the next version of yourself, and checking yourself to make sure that you're challenging yourself to make sure you're educating yourself on, am I doing things the right way, or am I complacent? Um, and I think when you talk about sustaining great culture. Um, that's the most important thing, man, because the core values, the non-negotiables, they're going to be there every day. Like over time, what ends up happening is those things truly do become who you are and what you do and your guys show up and they understand when you say, yeah, this is optional, that it's optional. They know that really means like we're giving you an opportunity to make a bad decision. Let's see if you make the right one. 
you know, they, they start making the right ones. I, you know, I tested our kids last week. You know, I knew that we were going to start lifting three days a week. They'd only been lifting two days a week. But so I'll let y'all talk about it and then we'll figure out, you know, if y'all want to lift that third day, we will. I gave them an opportunity to make a bad decision or make the right decision. What do you, you know, what did they decide? They decided we were going to work, work out three days a week. It's because they're good kids. They're bought in, right? I don't even think they hesitated. They just were like, yeah, we're going to live three days a week. Um, <sighs> but anyways, that's just part of like the steps that we've already taken from a culture standpoint to make sure that we're moving down the path and preparing ourselves for, for a lot of future success because they're all like, man, nah, I had, I, I could be a slap dick if I wanted to, but I'm, I'm not because I believe in what we're doing here and we're going to do great things. You know, my coaches, that was the other thing I was going to say about, sorry, I, I totally stopped that thought, but sustaining great culture. Um, I think as the head coach of an organization, one thing you constantly have to do is to be checking to make sure that you're surrounding yourself with the right people, right? Um, when I was at South, we had an A plus coaching staff. Nobody's out there trying to take Coach Gray's job. We're all there just trying to help our kids be the best they can be, build a great culture, win a lot of baseball games, make sure that they're great young men and great athletes, right? That's what we did every day. That was our that was our northern star. That was our compass, right? Um so as a coach, I think now I'm realizing as the head coach, you know, you gotta always be making sure that you surround yourself with the right people. And I couldn't be more happy with the guys that I have around me. Coach Allison, Coach Brown, Coach Bowie, um, Coach Brody, Coach Kershaw. I mean, that's a bunch of dudes drinking from the same water hose, locked in on all levels of our program on what we're trying to do. Um, and we're going to be really good because of it. But at some point, you always have to reevaluate and say, okay, do we need to bring somebody else in? Is there somebody who's become a cancer? You know, I don't think we have people in our group who would do that, but it's something you always have to evaluate um, when you talk about sustaining great culture, because it's very, very easy to get complacent and ignore things that you shouldn't ignore. And next thing you know, you're in a massive mess because you got people working against you, not with you. Whereas right now we got a bunch of dudes working with each other. So that's that. All right. So. <clears throat> Just as a refresher recap on what we talked about today, because we're closing in on the hour long or the hour mark of the pod. Um, talked about great culture, what it is, what is what it isn't, and why it's important. We talked about the steps to building great culture, which was step one, giving your program, looking at it, looking where you are, giving yourself an honest assessment, everybody, what's working, what's not. Um, then we talked about the next step in the process, which is establishing those championship traits and championship traits are your core values. That's who we want to be. Your non-negotiables. That's telling us where we're going to go and how we're going to get there or how we're going to do it. The third part of that was, uh, establishing the expectations of your program. And that's going to tell us why we do what we do. All right. After that, we talked about executing on the vision and we talked about how important it is to be committed to doing things the right way every day, even when it's tough. You know, the big takeaway from that is what you allow is what you promote. And it starts at the top. If you're not doing it the right way as the head of your program, you can't expect anybody else to do it the right way. OK, everything starts and goes with you. All right. And then finally, we talked about sustaining great culture. And the big takeaway there is. Never get complacent. Complacency is terrible. The minute you get complacent, people are pat, people are going to pass you, uh, and you're going to take massive steps back. And I think in closing, I'll just say, I, I kind of touched on this earlier, but it's not normal to be great, whether it's you're talking about a championship program or you're talking about just great culture. Okay. It's not normal. The world wants you to be less than great, okay? The world tells you as a coach, 
hey man, if you put nine of the best athletes out there, if you if you put nine of the best athletes who are all about them and not about the team and the program, you'll be fine. What we know as coaches who have built great culture is that couldn't be any farther from the truth, right? I would take blue collar, gritty dudes who were C plus in talent, who understood their role and how important it was to the team, whether it was a starting role, a, you know, um, situational role or whatever. I would take those dudes over the five star any day of the week. And I mean that I told somebody, somebody a while back was like, I mean, what you going to start when you going to start recruiting a bunch of dudes to come to Trinity? And I was like, I'm not, I don't want a mercenary squad over there. That's not what I want. Um, if people show up and want to play, that's fine. But I don't care how good they are because if they're not bought into what we're doing here, they won't play. Um, and people are like, man, you don't mean that. I do mean that because I would rather lose um, than sacrifice the culture and what we're trying to build. Um, and it is what it is. Uh, I gave myself a timeline on how long I'm going to do this. And... I made a promise to myself, promised my wife, and a promise to a lot of people that at the end of that timeline, I was going to look back on this and I was going to say I did it my way. And uh, because I think my way works. And I think we've proven that over over the years. Um, that's what we're going to do. Like, I'm not going to, I'm I'm not out here chasing, you know, a bunch of, guys bouncing around from school to school to try to win a Skiza State Championship. I want dudes that want to be a Trinity, that want to be a part of what we're doing here. And I think over time, what we will do, and I, I tell our guys from this class, this class, this all the time, 20 years from now, when Trinity Baseball is where I think Trinity Baseball is going to be in 20 years, people will look back to this 2023-2024 team and they will say, those dudes blazed the trail for what they were trying to do here. And people will forever remember that. They will. Um, and I've said this, I don't have a bunch of D1 baseball players on my team. But what I do, do dude, is a bunch of, I have a, what I do have is a bunch of blue collar, gritty dudes who just show up every day and try to be 1% better than they were the day before and just get after it. And they do it as a team. They love each other. They love us as coaches. They are like a sponge. They do everything the right way. And they're going to stub their toe and they're going to mess up some things along the way, no doubt about it. But my point to all that is like, never believed I needed the best players for us to do great things. I always believed that we had to have the best culture. And if you look at the things we've done in the past, our guys have done in the past, the years we had really talented teams at, when I was a player and when I was a coach. The years that the culture did not match the talent, we didn't go near as far as we should have. I think about my team from 2007 that I played on. The least talented team I played on at South Florence uh, in my four years there. Played for a lower state championship. That senior class had not one college graduate on it. I mean, sorry, had not one college uh, baseball player on it. But we beat the number seven ranked team in team in the country twice, which had nine Division One commits on it. You know what was different? That was a team full, loaded, five star D one talent, C minus culture, R N C plus players, A plus culture. Okay, we were that type team that if you let us hang around, um. We were going to keep fighting and gritting, and we're we're just gritty, and we're a bunch, like a bunch of gnats. But we played great as a team, and um, we did what we did. I mean, I you know we look at South Lawrence. I've said this a bunch of times. This year's team at South Lawrence was not the most talented team that I coached, but they were the best team that I coached. Um, and we went farther than any team in South Lawrence history since 1976 went. And couldn't be more proud of those guys. And it's just that right there, 
that team right there is going to, those seniors on that team from 2023 next year, they got college players on that team, but they're not, not going to have a single guy who's signed right this moment when the season starts, which is really a travesty because there's about four of them, five of them who should be signed. But anyways, um, those dudes just bought into the culture aspect of this and what it means to be a team and what it means to drink from the same water hose and what it means to just execute on the little things every single day and how that results in the wins and championships and all that. They were committed to that. So my point of all that is like, I've always believed I didn't need the best team or sorry, the most talented team to win a lot of baseball games. I do believe you have to have to have, you have to have the best culture though. Um, because again, great culture closes the gap when you're overmatched and it separates you from the other teams when you're, when they're overmatched. Right. So that's culture. And that is going to close down our building better episode. Number two, building better culture. Um, I feel like this one didn't flow as well. Probably spent too much time looking at this note thing over here. So it didn't come naturally. But, uh, and I also talked for an hour and five after I said I was going to try to keep that a little bit shorter. But anyways, um, thank you again to everybody who continues to to like, follow, subscribe, listen, and all that. I'm making a slight change to, uh, to the format here. Um, I'm going to start uploading the videos once a week via YouTube. So if you can help a man out. Still going to be podcast episodes on Apple Music and or Apple Podcast and Spotify, but I'm trying to get the YouTube channel up and going because it's looking like everything's shifting to like YouTube has like a podcast thing now. I, anyways, if you can help a man out, like and subscribe, please. Um, going to post this one next week, so sometime in August, I guess you'll be seeing this one. The most of you have already probably listened to uh building better hitters by this point, but um, always open to feedback. So if there's anything you agree, disagree with, whatever, have any emotional outbursts, something that bothered you, whatever, let me know. Let's talk about it. Um, and again, uh, our job here, trying to build better athletes, coaches, and people, man. That That's what it comes down to. Um, I couldn't do it without each and every one of y'all tuning in and listening to the show every day or every week. So thank you for continuing to do that. Um, I had no idea this would grow to the size that it's grown over the course of the last six months to a year. Um, and I owe that to all of y'all who continue to get on here and listen to me run my mouth for an hour every time. But I um, just wanted to express my gratitude and appreciation for that because, again, uh, without the following it, you know, if nobody listened to the message, then it wouldn't be worth doing. But the fact that some of you do sit here and listen to it and hopefully take something from it means the world to me. So, um, as always, you know, if, if you can, the number one thing you can do to help outside of liking and, sub and subscribing, um, would be to share it with a friend. So if there's somebody that's in the baseball community or in a leadership role or, you know, whatever, who you feel could benefit by listening to some of these messages, let them know, um, and that's one way that you guys could really help us out. So outside of that, that's all I got. So until next time, be cool and go Titans. See ya.